This chapter is going to present a high-level approach to how to create systems. And I might be wondering, like, why do you care about this? Well, as an accountant or as an IS student, you're going to deal with new system rollouts. How do you upgrade a major system? How do you create a system from scratch? How do you outsource a system? How do you purchase a system and integrate into your operations? There's a whole bunch of these different processes you're going to have to be comfortable with when you have work out there in the real world. So this chapter is giving you a high level view of how all of these systems and development processes will be handled. When we talk about this, we're going to break down a couple of major things. We want to talk about what are the major phases of this development lifecycle. You know, who's involved, what are the major roles. We'll talk about some of the basic planning techniques we use. We'll discuss some feasibility. In other words, how do you budget for stuff? But it's not going to be our major emphasis in this chapter. We will focus a little bit more on reactions. How do people react after a new system is put into place? And what things should you do to help minimize and deal with those issues? Now, why is this an issue? Well, you can read some good examples in the textbook that talk about systems that have gone wrong. Now, a lot of these systems have been out there for a really long time. So for this IRS system that's given in this focus example here is 40 plus years old. So when you're dealing with 40 year plus old legacy code, it's a pretty heavy burden. You've got a lot of people that are no longer working at the IRS who are involved in setting the system up. You've got really old technology being used uh, whether programming languages or maybe servers. And so you have a lot of stuff to kind of deal with. And these systems are huge and really, really intricately designed. And you can't break them. And that's the biggest challenge to all of this stuff. It's sort of like looking at a bridge and saying, okay, we got to change out this old bridge for a new bridge without disrupting any traffic that goes on. I mean, it's a pretty challenging task. And so you look at the IRS and you can see some really good examples of failures. So we had a $3.3 billion upgrade that failed, an $8 billion modernization. And you can look at this and criticize the IRS, but the reality is that all large organizations are like this. Whether you look at banks, whether you look at the DMV, whether you look at IBM, we have all of this legacy code that has to be updated and maintained even while not disrupting any, any of the actual operations and trying to keep it on task and on budget. So what do we do with it? Well, we have this system development life cycle that has five different steps. And the idea here is it's sort of like a waterfall. And we say a waterfall because you start at the top and you work your way down. And if you do it right, you just go down. So we start at the top. We say, what's the requirements of our system? What should the system actually do? Then we build a blueprint. Once we know the goals of the system, we can actually design it. Then we build it. Then we put it live. In other words, go from it being on a shelf or on a development computer to actually being used by end users. And then we have this operation phase where we basically use it going forward. And the hope is that we just go down the waterfall. Now, unfortunately, the reality is it's not always that simple. What we often find is what we think we know about a system under the analysis phase, we get into the conceptual phase, and we realize actually there's something we missed here. So think about the IRS. If we go in and we say, okay, we want to be able to submit a 1040 form, personal tax form, and that's this, the idea of the system requirements. That form needs to be submitted. Well, okay, that's great. Well, you get into the next phase, conceptual design, and then realize, well, actually, if we want to do the 1040, the general income form, we really need to have some of these extra schedules as well. Because if you don't have the schedules, you can't really build out the major form. And so you end up having to go backwards and change the scope. Then, okay, all right, great. We'll do a couple of the side forms as well. We get into conceptual, build out blueprint. Perfect. Now we get in the physical design phase. Physical design means I take it from a paper, that says what the system should do, and actually make code that runs that. Usually what you'll find, though, is you'll find some kind of problem in physical design. For example, maybe you realize at the physical design stage that your system has to be able to handle both native citizens with a social security number, as well as people who are immigrants or in the process of immigrating, as well as people who are here illegally, as well as people who are just visiting. So we have all these different things that we have to integrate with. Okay, what do we do? Well, we realize we made a mistake on the blueprint, so we go back to the blueprint, and we go back to the conceptual design, we redesign our blueprint, then we come back down again to the physical design. Okay, great. 
Then you get into implementation and conversion. This is often a very challenging phase because if you've made any mistakes in the conceptual or physical design, you probably don't realize it until you get down to implementation. This is where you go live with a new system and you realize, oh shoot, we didn't allocate enough servers to run this system, or there's not enough bandwidth, or there's a really big bug in it we didn't realize that we had. And now what will happen sometimes is you actually give up on the implementation. You say, it's too much, we can't actually use the system as is. So you go back up to the conceptual or physical design to fix the issues and then try to implement it a second time. If you've done your job right, you get all the way down to operation and maintenance. This is where the bulk of the effort actually runs with most systems. And it's kind of tricky because you think of the budget line when you're creating a system, but actually most of the investment is over here on the back end. And this is a time everybody is tired, everyone is ready to move on, and the system still needs updates, it still needs versions, it still needs bug fixes. So if we dive into each of these five steps, we'll see that we can kind of break it down to specific tasks. So under our phase number one, systems analysis phase, here's some things that should happen in that phase here. So first off, we go out there and you ask questions. You say, what's the system supposed to do? You find out what the existing systems do now. You find out what is the level of cost we're dealing with here. And it could be that your project actually ends at this stage. You could say, hey, you know, we, we need a system that does these three things. You go out there and you budget out how much these things cost, and you realize it's just not worth it. And you're better off staying with a manual system, with an Excel sheet, or with literally paper. At the end of this phase, you should have a basic idea, though, of what the system needs to accomplish. And then, hopefully, you move forward. At this point, you have your, sort of your first checkpoint. In most organizations, you will have a key yes or no decision at this point. So you do all the analysis phase, and really our overall goal is to do as little as possible work in this phase that leads us to a good yes, go, or no go decision. You think that's weird, right? Well, why do we need to minimize our work? Well, we're minimizing it because we don't want to overinvest. It's possible that management says no at that first point. If you spent a ton of time building out a system, that's just a waste of money. So we want to make sure we've done enough work to have information to know if it's feasible and what the costs are going to be. Next, we get into conceptual design. You can think of this as paper. Everything needs to be written down and designed. This would be the screens, this would be reports, this would be data diagrams, this would be the database, all that kind of stuff. Then you get into the actual physical design. Physical design says you go from stuff being on paper to things being in code. So with our code, we have things like the actual reports are being put together. So you have a paper version up here in conceptual, but then you build it in our actual programming language down in physical design phase. We work on our database, you design input and controls, all that kind of stuff. The end of this phase is really the de develop system. So the end of system analysis is enough for a go yes, no decision, right? That's our key output. The key output of the conceptual design phase is a set of paper docs. So you can think of the documentation or the plan. The key for physical design is the actual develop system. All right, next phase, implementation and conversion. This means we have to go live. This means we make a plan, we train people, we install stuff, we buy servers, and then usually there's some kind of documentation that needs to be completed, and then finally you have some kind of switch over. Last, you have operations and maintenance. We're gonna fine tune, we're gonna operate, we're gonna maintain all that kind of normal operations. So this is the process. Now in this one, you notice it's not designed in the same way. Our first is a waterfall. We go down the waterfall. We try not to go back up. A more modern approach is something called Agile. An Agile approach basically means that I know I don't have enough information up front to do a really solid system analysis and conceptual design and physical design. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break the system into parts and do one piece at a time. And so for each piece, I'm going to go through and do the analysis, the conceptual, the physical implementation and operations. And then once I get through the whole cycle with part one, I go do the second one. This could also be the case for purchasing a system. Maybe I want to update from QuickBooks, which is a fairly simple, straightforward accounting system, to one that's more optimized for a big business. Well, I might break apart the system into parts. I might first do just inventory. 
And then I'll go through the whole process, getting our inventory systems, tracking it, recording it in our new accounting system. Then I might do the AR process, then the AP process, then payroll, but I'll do one module at a time. That's an agile approach. Now, why might you want to do an agile approach? Well, you can look at some examples. So the US military hired EDS to build a network for their servers. So they had this great idea, great, we're going to outsource it, people who are really good at what they're doing, and they're going to build a network for us. What could go wrong, right? Well, it turns out quite a bit can go wrong. EDS didn't really understand the culture of the military, and so they, they weren't ready to handle the kind of overhead that they were required to verify. They also didn't verify all of the estimates. So the Navy said, hey, we've got about 5,000 software programs. But actually, there were 67,000 to configure. It's a huge, huge gap. And so they really underestimated how much it would take them to customize each computer. And sometimes they even had to fix the old software to make it work on the new computers. Because they didn't have the sort of experience with the culture, they didn't realize they needed military clearances. So they couldn't even get on the bases. Um, they realized that they needed no information about service members' ranks, but they didn't ask that information. So a lot of coordination problems. And so what they did was they realized that they really had to find some way to manage this. So instead of doing everything simultaneously, they broke it down into pieces. They did some of the larger bases first. They tried to reuse stuff. They use old computers before buying new ones. And they focus on job function instead of individual people. And so some of the process of these systems is you have to expect you're going to learn things. And that's just part of the process of doing a new software implementation. So why should we really care about this? Well, if you look at some stats on software projects, you find that most of these are very problematic. So almost all projects are late. Over half are over budget. Almost two thirds are unsuccessful, and a third are just canceled outright. So you think about being a manager. Imagine you're in charge of the accounting department, and it's time to do an upgrade, and you're looking at the new system, and you realize up front, hey, I've got a one in three chance of this entire thing failing, and a two in three chance of it not achieving my goals. That's kind of a high risk approach for you. But the reality is, it just it needs to be done. Accountants are some of the original system users and developers because they were really key early on in automation and building out computers. And it's just part of our job. And so we see we really need to think about how to do these systems well because you are going to be responsible for doing system upgrade projects. And some of these projects dealing with legacy systems are really quite time consuming. So as one example, the California DMV wanted to add social security numbers to a driver's licenses system. Well, it took 18 people an entire year just to add that one field. So we're talking about a crazy amount of inertia and cost for something as simple as adding a single field. Now, what are some of the things that you might need to think about? Well, we can still get some examples. Australians uh, ha have this firm called Woolworths. And they've tried to transition from an older legacy system to a new system. So legacy basically just means old. And SAP is a real standard, kind of well-known system that's used by a lot of organizations these days. And so what we see here is a failure in tailoring for an output. They were used to getting profit and loss reports, but with a new system, they couldn't generate them for almost a year and a half. And the root of the problem is people didn't really understand your own processes. And again, it seems crazy here, but basically the idea is that knowledge in an organization often just resides in people's heads. So as senior staff left the company over the six-year project, all that new knowledge was just lost. We also see problems with data. So Target's got a good example of this. They figured that they would have no old data, just new information. But unfortunately, what they found was that people were actually manually typing in all of this information with incorrect, inf incorrect data. And we were done by entry-level employees with no experience to help them. We also see that the tight deadlines also have an issue. And as a result, only about 30% of the data was actually correct. And so we look at this, we can see a lot of common issues. We see overall optimism at the beginning of the process. You have to realize the problem is going to be bigger than we expect. We see tight deadlines, and we see a lack of quality control. We also see issues with standardization. 
maybe you have multiple sites and you decide you want to just pull them all over into a single location. Well, as an example from Washington Community College System, you see there can be problems with this too. They had 34 campuses in the system and they wanted to standardize on a single PeopleSoft ERP system. But what they realized was that the campuses all did business slightly differently. So what they had to do was actually standardize all the business processes first and then actually begin to automate. We also see issues with vendors. So it might be that you hire a company to help you do a rollout only to have them go bankrupt and someone else has to come in and take over for you. So with all of this process, what you find is that a lot of people are going to resist new systems. And this could be a very rational response because you're employee, you're working along, you're doing your job, everything is fine. And then some person you don't know comes in and says, hey, I'm going to change your whole job. You're going to have new systems, new processes, and a lot of stuff to learn. So bad things happen. What we find is that people get upset and they get mad at the new system. This could be because of errors or disruption. It even can degenerate into people actually deliberately sabotaging the new system. You also find a lot of projection. Whenever things change, it's easy to point fingers at the new system. It's slow, it's buggy, it's ugly, I don't like it. When really it could just be that you don't like that something's changing in your life and you're taking it out on the system. We also see a lot of people just try to avoid it. They'll minimize any, doing anything they don't have to do with the new system. They'll try and stick with the old system as long as possible and you'll have to just literally pry it out of their fingers before they'll let go of the old computers. So why does this happen? Well, one is just fear. Anytime things change, people are going to be unhappy because they're used to status quo and they're happy with the status quo. It's also fear of losing status. Imagine if you're a middle manager. You've been at this organization for a decade, two decades. You know how things work. But then they come in and they remove the system you understand, you know how to get the best out of it, with a completely new system. And suddenly all of your institutional knowledge you spent decades building up is actually worthless. And the new intern that just came in this summer knows just as much as you do. We also can see a lack of top management support. These are big, expensive initiatives. And a lot of times management doesn't want to invest to make them successful. And so if you don't have that, it's very hard to get people to buy in. Usually you've got some bad prior experiences from former projects that have failed. Again, if every time one of these comes out, you have a one in three chance of it dying completely, it makes you not want to put a lot of investment into them. You often find real poor communication. Management will spend a lot of time working on something, roll it out, and at the very end, announce people with just a week's warning, hey, your job's about to just change. Disruption, these take more time and more effort you got to do your job plus do all of the transition work. We also see that top and lower level employees have different perspectives on a system. A top level employee is going to think about reporting and analysis and long-term cost support. Lower employees are going to think, oh, well, my shortcuts don't work or the screens are in a different order. You will find that people's backgrounds change how they deal with it. People who are very new and very young often can adjust faster. That's not always the case. It might be that your new employees are just as fixed as old people. It depends on how open are they to technology. Are they adaptable? Can they deal with change? So how do we deal with this? What are some behaviors that we can do? Well, one is resources. If you're going to do something that makes people work harder, you need to have some bonuses, some extra time off. You need to give them some carrots. You need to focus on what the users actually want. In other words, fix the bugs that make them slow and unproductive. You need to involve users on to find out what their needs are. And you need to worry about fears. How can you help people feel more comfortable with this system? One of the ways you can do this is by emphasizing new opportunities. Saying that, hey, you know what, this is a new system. We know it's a lot of work, but once we have it done, we can have some new interesting job roles for analytics. We'll be able to upgrade people. One of the biggest things you can do is emphasize that we can automate some of the boring stuff that you do so that you can do more interesting higher level tasks. You need to provide enough training, which is a super consistent problem. You need to evaluate people based off of the new goals of the system. If you want them to work together, you need to give them rewards off of that. So as one example, if you reward people based off of individual performance, they're not going to be motivated to help their teams do well. 
if you want them to work well with the team, you need to give them bonuses based off the entire team's performance, not just theirs. And a big one is testing. These always take longer than you expect because you don't know what you don't know. And then lastly, be realistic. You have to come into it with the knowledge that there's going to be things you discover. It's going to be harder and take longer and cost more than you expect it's going to be, but that you'll get through it if you will commit. So let's look at another example. The Department of Defense has got a massive budget and thousands of computer systems. One of their problems is that getting data between systems often requires manually re-entering it. So how have they been working on it? So they've actually had three failures already, and they're trying again to try and do their automation and modernization project. Unfortunately, a lot of times system developers struggle because DOD barriers exist. People want to protect their processes, the procedures, and chain of command. People resist change because what's better for them is actually worse for the DOD and vice versa. So one of the things they've done is providing this new mindset. So now the Air Force is promoting people based off of their actions that improve the entire Air Force rather than those that defend their specific area. And I love this quote by Upton Sinclair. It's real hard to figure, to convince someone if your salary depends on not understanding it. So who's involved in this process? Well, we have different levels of groups and each of them have their own specific set of tasks. So first, let's start with the top steering committee. Steering committee are executives. These are people who are looking at business-wide things, but they don't do the actual work. Instead, they delegate that to the actual project team. The project team are the, usually cross-disciplinary groups. So you might have both managers, you might have subject matter experts, might have programmers. Different people come together all on the project development team, and they do the actual work for the system. On the team, you'll have programmers. Programmers create programs. You have system analysts. These are people who work with the programmers and with the users to try and help everyone be on the same page. We have management to try and get people involved. And then we also have system users, or you might call them subject matter experts. These are people who have specific jobs in the organization that you bring into the project team because they know how the process actually works. So what we want to do is the project development plan. We're not going to talk about master planning. That's a little out of scope for this class here. But the project plan basically ties together an individual project. You identify what are the people, hardware, software, and money needed for a project to actually happen. We're not going to deal with PERT at all, but Gantt charts are helpful. A Gantt chart is a bar that shows how different processes link together. So for example, if I've got three tasks, I've got my first task, my second task, and my third task, then I need to go ahead and link them. So I say A has got to be done before the second can start, and the second has to be done before the third can start. In a real project, you'll have multiple tasks. I might have three that all depend upon A being finished. And looking at a chart like this, I can look at it and say, hey, you know, the first to second to third, I can't let any of those slip. But these two right here, I can let these ones slip because they have some gap or some buffer in my plan. So here's a slightly nicer version of the same thing. You see a Gantt chart is set out with individual tasks or activities on the left-hand side. And then we have bars that we fill in on the right to show tasks that are done. And then you also probably identify dependencies. You, know, you can't start the programming until after you make the specifications, for example. We also need to talk about feasibility. Do we have a business case? This could be economic, saying, are we going to save money on the new system? Now, often, that's actually not the case. Often, computer systems are a huge investment that you can't really justify on an ROI basis. Often, instead, it comes down to a strategic viewpoint or a technical viewpoint. Do you need to replace the old system because it's just so out of date, you can't support it anymore? Or is the old system limiting us and we can't do certain things because we have all this antiquated old technology? It might also be legal. Maybe there's a law about personal information we have to comply with. We need to think about scheduling. Can we get it done in the time that we have available? And operational, do we have got the right people involved in this? So take a step back again. We have these five different phases, all right? Investigation, system survey, feasibility, information needs requirements, and system analysis report. These are all part of that first big phase. And the whole goal here is to do these different tasks 
and end with some sort of proposal and a go, no-go decision. We want to have as much information as possible to make a good decision, but no more. And you can find some good comics out there talking about problems in this phase. You see that we have initial proposals, we have what it's sold, what's actually built, and what the users actually wanted at the end here. So hopefully this gives you a high-level overview of the SDLC and some of the ideas of what happens inside of this early on process. So again, to go back, let's go back to the beginning here. This is the overall SDLC, five phases. This chapter talks more about the first phase, what happens up on the top. And really the key thing is that go, no go decision that happens here. When we go between the systems analysis phase and conceptual design phase, we have to understand what's necessary up front so we can make a good decision on whether we can do this project or not. All right, now that we've done the first phase, the next couple of chapters will start breaking out the conceptual, physical design, implementation, and operations and maintenance phases.